All right, you want me to just go into the intro? Yeah, go right ahead. You're the director. I'm here in support of. So what? Are, yeah, you you. <laughs> I'm you going. generate the you generate the flow, babe. Three, two, one. Let's kick it. Hey, internet! Welcome to Next Little Nerd's Movie Podcast, where we share our love of movies with you. Yes, you. Christopher Ferrucci. We'll get to we'll get to that. Anyways, most of the time we discuss, defend, and promote movies we enjoy that weren't considered critically or commercially successful, but sometimes we just ramble. So do us a solid and remember to send us all the likes and positive reviews you can afford, and be sure to share the podcast with your friends and family. However, if you'd like to take your nerdiness to the next level, go to patreon.com slash nextlevelnerd and send us a dollar to help us grow and improve the podcast and the overall NLN community. Starting in September, Patreon supporters at any level will receive an exclusive bonus episodes of the NLN Movie Podcast. Just record did that uh, yesterday, I think it was. It's me and Evan Ruby um, talking about uh, a lot of various subjects surrounding movies and uh, some pretty hilarious times in our lives. So uh, we can also be found on Twitter at NLN Movies, Facebook.com slash Next Level Nerd, and at our homepage, www.nextlevelnerd.com. Now let's jump in, nerd out. I'm Justin, he's Mitchell, and this is episode number 31, Total Recall, 1990. 1990, thank you for the disclaimer, I was waiting for that. Right. Yeah, I've still still never seen the um, the Colin is it Colin Farrell? Yes, Colin still Farrell. Still never saw that version. Not that I think any less of it or whatever. I or have any opinion on it really. Um, Total Recall, what? the 1990 version, is absolutely uh, an awesome movie that that I love returning to like once every six or seven years and being like, holy shit, this is good. It's good. It's three years before Last Action Hero for Schwarzenegger. So oh. this is Schwarzenegger at his Schwarzeneggerist. <laughs> Somehow that sounds racist, but keep going. Okay. Scratch that last one. <laughs> I also did want to say that I, I did not watch the remake with Colin Farrell, but it did have the same feel of the same era's release of tom cruise's minority report yeah also a philip k dick story which as you know minority report the script was written for the total recall sequel yeah with schwarzenegger called minority report and it never went anywhere until they just rehashed it as a tom cruise movie <laughs> which sucks but on the other hand minority report's pretty good it wasn't bad, but I'm glad it wasn't the sequel to Total Recall. Because right. That one has a lot of gems. I'm glad it was in 1990 because that, you're bridging the gap between the 80s and the 90s at that right. point. And what defines itself more, an 80s movie or a 90s movie? Oh, that's so hard to, uh, to compare the two. But, I mean, there are these movies like this that land, like, right like, – 89 to 91 where it's like is this an 80s movie or a 90s movie there's exactly. no strict divide and like i said before teenage mutant ninja turtles is that perfect blend of 80s oh, that, and 90s such a good blend i make a turtles reference every single day regardless if people get it or not i don't care yeah well i mean you're absolutely right that is that is one of the most quotable films of all time, but th it doesn't even have to be a quote. It's just about turtles in general. Yeah, it's true. Well, this movie is absolutely another one of those for me that kind of weaved together my uh, kindergarten into third grade years. This was the the kindergarten cop for the for the cool kids. I feel yeah. So we've got a couple of of taglines. Um, but before we get into that, and before we also get into that, let me hit you with the story. When I was younger, yes. obviously in the early nineties, and I mentioned this, I swear every single podcast we have that my 
upbringing was based off of edited for television movies. Mm. Um, honorable <laughs> mentions get such as uh, M- Melon Farmers, Monster Scratchers, uh, Scum Bomb. That was a big Slug one. in a Ditch was always a that, good one. Th- there you go. Thank you. Praise be to you. So watching Total Recall on maybe TBS reruns <laughs> over and over and over, not knowing anything about the bigger world that I live in, one random <laughs> Sunday, pasta Sunday at my grandfather's, he's like, I got a bunch. He's always giving me stuff, regardless of what it is. One of them was a VHS tape of the original Total Recall. (laughs) And I was like, I've seen this movie a hundred times. Like, why are you giving this to me, old man? So one random afternoon, I popped that VHS into the VCR and holy (laughs) S-H-I-T. It changed F-bombs, your life. Bombs, the blood, the gore. Which yeah. Once I really <laughs> engulfed myself into that, that is actually the theatrical release. Yeah. It all made sense. <laughs> this is the movie that that made you bridge the gap between the realities of edited for TV and theatrical release. Well, exactly, because whenever he's <laughs> and when we get into it, whenever he pulls that arm out and it's just a rebar and he shoves it through the guy's head and <laughs> when, when they're trying to recall his ass back to Earth, yeah. it's it's. I was like, holy. Watching it now that I'm 34, I'm like, whoa, those, those effects are those are good, those yeah. are acceptable. But as like a eight year old, you're like, oh my goodness, oh my god, <laughs> yeah. you're like, that was real. It was very <laughs> unsettling, but it it wasn't to the point where I had nightmares. Like it was right. Uh, I don't know how I had nightmares and was afraid of the Dolph Chucky from Child's Play. But. Yeah, I love those movies. Yeah, me too. Anyways, that's my story. They're all in good fun. Exactly. Well, the, uh, you know, Total Recall, the first time uh, I saw this movie, we'll we'll get to that, but uh, the first time I saw it was on video because most of the movies that I watched throughout the 80s were, um, my parents were big into renting or they had previously taped stuff off, off of HBO. Um, <laughs> yes. So you just reminded me of another story uh, with Back to the Future. I never knew that there was a beginning to that movie because our VHS, when it recorded it off of HBO, it had like changed the um, like the or it, it had, like, started destroyed yeah, it started the movie recording. and it started recording where the DeLorean rolls down the back of the uh, truck in the parking lot of the mall. And I was just like, oh, that's where that movie starts. Like, for, there's like a whole 40 minutes before that happens. <laughs> like, or probably like 20 minutes. But it's still, it sets, like, Marty comes back and his parents are all like these normal people. And I was like, what? why are they like celebrating this? Like, never even knew that his parents were absolute idiots in the 80s in the original like in the opening of the movie that is such a great reference because i feel like a lot of my upbringing was confu uh, accepting movies as the vhs <laughs> garbaged them to you and yeah. then as you got older and things were presented to you as they normally would be to uh, other adults right you're like what <laughs> yeah. what is this what else have i been cheated out in life well, and we had like most of our movies are uh, were uh, taped off a of TV and stuff because like that's what you did back then. Like you'd pull up the TV guide or something, and you'd be like, "Okay, so this week this is airing. I'm going to record this." And for me, we were so poor. We, I had to call my aunt and be like, "Hey, record this for me." And I'd give her a list like every week, and she'd buy me video cassettes and tape things for me. Bro, I'm not going to compete. <laughs> About who is poorer here, but let me just tell you that at one point, my Ghostbusters, um, ha- that what's that their warehouse? Yeah, we we put our video camcorder on top of the warehouse and recorded the damn television for the Little Mermaid <laughs> to have that on VHS. Okay, <laughs> and halfway through it, my brother and I started fighting, rolling off the couch. So there's 
a little bit more violence in that movie than <laughs> if you watch that particular version. I kind of want to watch that. You need to yeah. find that tape. We need to put that shit on YouTube. Exactly. That's, <laughs> if you got a damn camcorder in the 80s and you're filming your television. Yeah. You guys were bootlegging before bootlegging was cool. <laughs> <laughs> And it was like nothing. It was like, okay, that's normal. Yeah, nor- people do that apparently. It's like yeah. Santa Claus actually exists if you're if you're filming movies like this. Yeah. We need to – we really do need to find that tape somewhere. I don't and, think it exists. Oh, you son of a bitch. I at least want a private screening. Well, I'm, me and my brother can reenact it for you. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that made the list of things that my dad – burned <laughs> all we need is a ghostbusters playhouse i you know i look at them on ebay maybe every <laughs> other week just for nostalgia purposes <laughs> so <laughs> taglines for this movie are pretty deep and philosophical which is something we're not used to there's a bunch of different version variations on this one how would you know if someone stole your mind it was like whoa did you just burp? I did. Excuse me. Thank you for saying but I wanted, excuse me. I'm glad that <laughs> that was an interrupting point because I wanted to mention now that you're, when you get into these taglines, watching this movie from 1990, it was it's like the Matrix had elements of this movie. Right. There were so con- many contemporary movies that had elements of this movie that these – like the Matrix and other contemporary releases were so successful – that this one blows them out of the water, but no one's going to know about it because it was like 30 years ago. Right. And it doesn't get as celebrated as it should be. I mean, this to me is on the same level as Terminator 2. Like, uh, Yeah, I would agree with that bold statement. Yeah, Because let's, it let's is just... Sensationalize it, baby. Just it go is, for it. It is Babe. just as creative. And this is the peak of practical effects right before... Everything was CGI. You know, I was watching a video today and did not know that the entirety of New York in the original Avengers was CGI. Like nice. The, the people filmed- running and stuff. Like, it was crazy. Because they filmed it in Cleveland. Yeah, they rebuilt the whole damn uh, the whole damn city of New York. Because or- it's cheaper to do it that way. Is that, <sighs> that not insane? That is insane. But anyways, so... um. The second tagline, they stole his mind, now he wants it back. Which I could see, like, a, that's a, such a good poster for Schwarzenegger to be on with that tagline. Yeah, it's a good tagline, but, I mean, I don't feel like it has a lot. I mean, there's more to the movie than just that. Well, it fits into the whole Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. You know, they stole his mind, now he wants oh, it back. You know, kind no. of kind like... You. For you explaining know. that to the lay, the lapers, the yeah. lapers, and then uh, I, I breed canines, <laughs> dogs, <laughs> for the <laughs> lapers. <laughs> so as they're going around the table at the uh, at the uh, marketing meeting, uh, they go over to Barry, who's been out drinking all night, and he's hungover as fuck. And they said, "Oh, how would you know if someone stole your mind?" Okay, that's a good one, Cindy. What do you have? They stole his mind. Now he wants it back pretty good hey barry what do you have uh get uh get ready for the ride of your life that's the tagline that's the tagline number three Uh, get ready uh, for the ride of your life (laughs) i mean what markets was that geared towards uh cedar point (laughs) so Uh, okay all right Uh, accepted confirmed (laughs) <laughs> the film was written uh, based on the short story of We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by Philip K. Dick, who's done A Scanner Darkly, Blade Runner, Minority Report, and Nick Cage in Next. Those White. movies. Next with Nick Cage? <laughs> yeah. Did not see that coming. It was based oh. off a Dick story. <laughs> that movie, all. That movie. W- had dick written all over (laughs) (laughs) yep all right thanks for listening everyone that ends the broadcast so it's also god how do i get past that it's like a whole bag of dicks wrote that one
<laughs> so some of those ba- some of those dicks that were also in on the story it was Ronald Shusett, Dan O'Bannon, who uh, were, took part in the Alien franchise. Uh, <laughs> Gary Goldman, who also helped out on Next and Big Trouble in Little China, which we have already reviewed that movie. So go back and check out the uh, episode on that one. John Pavel, who basically did lots of sci-fi work, mostly on TV with stuff like Star Trek Voyager. But the creme de la creme, la piste de resistance, Paul Verhoeven directed this son of a gun. Verhoeven. Where have you been? So... He's also the director of RoboCop. That's where uh, all that gore and bloodlust was coming from in this movie, Mitchell, as and you talked about. Th- thank you with the bloodlust comment. And I will also say this, that a New York Times article in hard copy from 1990, 90% of the damn review, the entire page, well, the entire page, review itself was juxtaposed with a giant picture of RoboCop advertising RoboCop. I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing in here? And obviously by the same people. There yeah. you go. So there's your RoboCop reference. One thing I never got about RoboCop is why did they ever not, not make a knockoff movie called HoboCop? <laughs> 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 Just have this homeless cop solving crimes. I think, they, I think they did. It was called House, maybe. <laughs> Hobo Cop. Solving Hobo crimes, Cop is good. Solving crimes and looking for dimes. Like people try to give him money, but he's yeah. like, no, he, I just, justice is my payment. He, says, <laughs> he holds up a, holds up a sign. We'll sol- solve crimes for food. <laughs> like he he has a problem where he cannot live indoors. He <laughs> he lives in a tent outside, and the tagline for the movie says "Hobo Cop is in tents." And he's like, "I'm Hobo Cop." Anyways, uh, get, man, get get ready for the ride of your life with that one. Oh, sold. <laughs> so Paul Verhoeven uh, is pretty cerebral director who's not afraid of action gore and controversy um you know he's also done uh, hollow man which was kevin bacon kevin bacon Thank you. and his penis well oh oh he, don't forget you, the penis you get the little bacon in that movie <laughs> Half you, pound. The, you get the turkey bacon in that one too hey you and elizabeth shoes in that one oh the shoe well, you know my feelings about her. Don't get I, me started. Well, you've inspired my feelings for her. <laughs> She's so wonderful. So he also did, uh, Verhoeven also did Basic Instinct, which, hey if you're going to throw Kevin Bacon's penis out there, go ahead and show Sharon Stone's birth canal. Um, <laughs> also known as the gratuitous beaver shot. <laughs> What movie is that? It's killing me. Oh, man. Is that um, Loaded Weapon? It is. It is Loaded <laughs> Weapon 1, National Lampoons. Uh, what's the... Uh, who, who's the guy? What? Damn it. What is his name? I know him. I love him. He, he dies, and then he comes back halfway through, and he's like, I thought this was the sequel. <laughs> I can't remember. It's not John Lithgow. It's... Acting, he sounds oh, like the, the voice oh, of the critic. Oh, 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 John Lovitz. John Lovitz, thank, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, Verhoeven's also done Starship Troopers, which I love. I that, I never got into it. Never. Have you ever sh- seen the original? That was the only movie with nudity in it that my grandmother did not drag me out by my ear. <laughs> I hope she's not listening to this. <laughs> no, that was uh, Starship Troopers. It, I think it pissed me off because in the marketing there was something like uh, this generation Star Wars. You know how like everything like Fifth uh, Element was supposed to be this generation Star Wars. Yeah, but it had Jake Busey in it. It, it did had, have Jake. Uh, Charlie Sheen's ex-wife. I mean, they had some. It had yeah. Doogie Doogie Hauser was in it. Yeah, he was the bad guy. And, For a uh, sci-fi flick involving shooting giant bugs, I think that one hit all the check marks. Yeah. 
But what? that's not what we're here to talk about. Nope. So the music in this movie is basically just like unique and hypnotic, dreamlike, synth-heavy on the soundtrack. Whoa. You just hit four very genius nouns because let me tell you the opening Those credits. Are adjectives. Thank you. The opening credits were mesmerizing and shows such as Stranger Things with that opening theme. Right. That the reason why that is successful is because of movies like this with opening credits right. and synth music like that. Mm-mm. that you don't have to have visuals because that music actually speaks to you on that different level. It's one of right. those type of soundtracks that will give you chills and makes you say, what's next? You're giving me chills because that uh, that reference to Stranger Things was spot on, spot on. Well, that's where Stranger Things got it right because they hit all the nostalgia buttons that people like us want to see and mm-hmm. hear. But this movie was one of the ones that is the reasons that it's around. So that's right. why we're talking about it. Well, and it has, you know, that th- these credits to me, when I see them, I, I, I hate to nerd out over credits, but sometimes, damn it, I just w- love to do that. Uh, Superman's opening credits, Superman the movie, is kind of what oh, I yeah. thought of with the font and the trails the, and stuff. And the, the laser of yeah. the... the that presentation makes you want to actually say, oh, oh, that person, oh, that's the key right. grip? Okay, I don't know who the hell that is. Maybe I'll go look him up in my local library whenever I get a second because it's 1990 and you don't know <laughs> who the hell these people are. But still, it's, it's, it makes you look at him more so than, okay, let's fast forward this. Yeah, let's- or like when the credits are over, over the action. You know, and we should do we should do an episode about our favorite movie credits or something sometime because <laughs> like the opening to uh City Slickers, there's a whole freaking cartoon there. Oh whoa, just like Christmas vacation. Yes. Oh whoa. You just hit a grand list. I was gonna make another list for this episode, but you know, I was gonna wait, but I think you just you might have been. You might be onto something there, Best Mr. McConnell. Opening credits. Maybe we could do that as a uh, episode for uh, one of the pa- for the Patreon, the bonus episodes. That'd be a I, short, short and tight one. I think that should be a short and tight one, and we should put everyone to task and debate all their asses and say, "Prove <laughs> me wrong." <laughs> the fiery playground in Terminator Two is better. <laughs> And the city yeah. slickers too open. The fiery playground. I feel like that is the where that podcast lives. <laughs> so speaking of Terminator 2, the cast has Arnold Schwarzenegger as Douglas Quaid and Hauser. Mind you, in the short story, it's Douglas Quail, but that's irrelevant at this point. But yeah. yeah. Quail, quail is kind of a I don't see Schwarzenegger as a quail. No, Quaid is so much cooler. <laughs> it is cooler. Rachel, I, I'm never sure how to pronounce her last name. Ticotin, I think, as Melina. We're going to go with Ticotin. Why do you have so much trouble with people's last names these, these I don't days? Know. It's because, well, I'll tell you later. Like Ray Manzarek. You're like, this is like Ray Manzarek. Whatever. Shut up. Don't so, make but, fun of me. So she was she was the prison guard Sally Bishop in Con Air, which we also already did an episode of. of oh uh, my that gosh! Movie. I yeah. didn't even realize that. I totally missed that until I started doing show prep. I, I totally missed that that she was nice. the prison guard. Great connection. Worked, yeah, she was also in uh, Falling Down with Michael Douglas, which oh, great such movie. a good movie. About a guy on a rampage. It's my favorite rampage movie, I think. Uh, Sharon Stone as Lori. Uh, like we said, Basic Instinct, Casino, Sliver. Mm-hmm. Whoa, okay. Quick and the Dead. I just want to make a quick shout out to Sharon Stone's use of uh, kicking um, Quaid's balls. Yeah, she movie. definitely goes nut hunting. <laughs> she, she is out for them Arnold testes. I kind of, I was wondering, like, nobody can take him down except for her when she kicks him in the balls. Well, I mean, if you were to fight Arnold Schwarzenegger in 1990, what are you going to do? I kick 
kick him in the balls immediately. You kick him in the balls. Or I would like throw bleach in his face or something. I would terminate those nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anyways, uh, Michael Ironsides as Richter. You might remember this dude from Top Gun, Starship Troopers. Oh, yeah. Uh, Scanners. Yeah, good call. Good call. Uh, plays Sam Fisher in the Splinter Cell video game series. He uh, talks like this. Everything he says is evil. And he was also in another movie we've already done, Terminator Salvation. Go back and listen to that episode. Oh, the, oh, he was also in the um the machinist with Christian Bale. There's ooh, your other connection. The machinist. I can't pronounce Which, names. Um Ronnie Cox as Velos Cohagen. 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 Copenhagen, we all need to winter green. Give those people that they're chewing tobacco now. <laughs> they want skull. <laughs> It's only a matter of time before the Schwarzenegger yeah, impersonation. You know it's happen. coming. Oh my gosh! One of my favorite Schwarzenegger lines is in this movie too, and I've been texting it to you. Go ahead. Since I Let's watched do it, it. <laughs> you've already <laughs> won. Give these people air. Copenhagen, Copenhagen, give those people some air. Give them air. Give, yeah, that's pretty good. Give these people air. <laughs> That is really good, and I'm trying to think. Of, aside from being on the surface of Mars and going, yeah, 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 my pussy. I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Ronnie Cox was also in Deliverance, RoboCop, Beverly Hills Cop, and the show Cop Rock. You remember that show, the singing cop show? Sounds familiar, but okay. I'm glad I don't remember it. He was also in uh, the 1990 version of Captain America with uh, <laughs> okay. with J.D. Salinger's son, Matt the, Salinger. The, the guy with the weird-looking nose. Why did I am Cohagen? <laughs> Give these people air. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <laughs> So this movie starts out with a badass opening credit scene, like we said. Um, but let's get into some of those reviews. All right. I'm going to hit you with a couple. Mind you, it's an overall positive thing. Here. It is. All right? It is. This movie, we're pretty much doing it because it's a little bit of a mixed bag. But on the whole, I think most people thought it was okay. Whereas I think it is freaking amazing. All right, so I'm going to give you – so quick – little little quick – Gene Siskel, here's a little quick one from him. Total Recall begins to self-destruct not long after Schwarzenegger arrives on Mars, and the story degenerates into a violent, stunningly foul-mouthed enterprise. <laughs> okay. He's right about that. The, true. What the fuck did they do wrong? <laughs> All right, here's – um. I, they started talking crap on uh, Verhoeven. Uh, here's one. Total Recall went through four directors before Verhoeven finally took it on. And four writers worked on the script. It's no wonder the finished film emerges without a, un a unifying style or a single performance worth mentioning. Ouch. Yeah, okay, that's ridiculous. What I wanted to get to was the – what they had mentioned in Wikipedia because mm -hmm, a lot of people like from the A to F scale, like Philip, yeah, contrasting it with Philip K. Dick stories here mm -hmm. and there. That's okay. But um, I'm going to, the references in Wikipedia are just as good from 1990, mind you. So these are good polls. So it's going to get, it's going to get real weird here and <laughs> allow me to tell you. So um, the film by a New York Times critic was considered excessively violent. Um, so and so the Washington Post gave it a negative review saying that dire director Paul Verhoeven, quote unquote, disappoints this appalling onslaught of blood and boredom. Ouch. Wait for it. Here's the best one. And I'm here comes the stinger. Feminist cultural critic 
this one okay i don't know why this gets tossed in here but apparently a feminist cultural critic is a thing and that's okay i well, respect I, that i'm a licensed feminist cultural critic you know that well this particular one called it one of quote unquote an endless stream of war and action movies in which women are reduced to mute and incidental characters or banished altogether oh yeah well, can we just say that the uh sharon stone like she was bad she's the only the person movie. that beats his ass and melina melina is a strong female character right. who is basically the leader of the revolution revolution Ab excuse me absolutely if anything schwarzenegger plays the dumbass you know trying to figure things out exactly because melina i can't remember you and she's like well okay well you're a double agent. Never mind. Yeah. All right. Here's one from TV Guide. Ugly, stupid, loud, offensive, and pointlessly violent. The end. <laughs> That's my favorite one. <laughs> is that guy talking about the movie or his mother-in-law? Oh. All right. Here's one from some <laughs> stupid, juicy, what have you. I don't even know what that publication is. Mediocre sci-fi. Gained a cult following for some unknown reason. So, mm, people are going to hate on it. I think they hate on it because of the violence and the gore, but from a sci-fi standpoint, I give it two thumbs up. Yeah, I, I mean, they're give, I give it four thumbs up. They're, damn it. Hey, all right. I, they you harsh know my me, mellow. They harsh Let me... It. I know, and that's why the beauty part about this podcast is shedding positivity on what once was basically placed as negative. Right. But this movie was overall received as positive. Right. But being that we're peeling back this negative side of things, it's like, uh, I think it makes us both uncomfortable. Mm hmm But – let me give you a couple of more. All right. Film Freak Central says, perhaps it goes without saying that Total Recall is no The Terminator, but let the records show. I'm a fool to think he'll make it as Johnny Carson of the action films. I don't even know what the hell that means. I don't know. Well, here's the last one, and here we go for Verhoeven again from Real Views. They're going after him. Neither Arnold Schwarzenegger nor Paul Verhoeven have stretched their talents here. Oh, yeah. I disagree, sir. I well, disagree. I, well, I mean, you could give a bad review and like I, I, whenever you're when you go that deep into a cut. I mean, that score was a two and a half out of four. Right. With, but that just, I mean, wow, that's bad. The thing, the thing is, like, people people really underestimate how smart Schwarzenegger is. Like, I think, like, you know, being uh, the big, you know, buff dude, you know, six five, or what is he? He's like six four, six five, and, you know, 200 pounds of rough freaking Austrian muscle. You know, people just assume that he's this muscle bound idiot, but he actually made his first millions in real estate before um, getting into the movie business, if I oh, recall wow. correctly. And, um, you know, he starred in uh, Pumping Iron, you know, and that was a that was a, a big thing, you know, that kind of brought him to the forefront, but he pursued an acting career, you know, like he went after it. And in the nineties, was there a bigger star than Arnold Schwarzenegger? Absolutely not. No, no, no. And, and the this one thing movie, I'm let me continue for just a second. This movie was, uh, the story was being kicked around from different studios and stuff. And it was Schwarzenegger who went after this role because he loved this story. He loves that sci-fi stuff. Uh, like James Cameron's Terminator and and this movie as well. And he chased it down and, and he got it to the right people to be able to buy the rights to it so he could star in it. That's a, a really great point. And the one thing I wanted to ask you, because I haven't done any research, which I soon will, is did he – did Schwarzenegger take any acting classes or how did he become – because in Total Recall, he does a really, really great job. Yeah. Acting. Well, I'm not sure. And, um, you know, I was talking about the uh, Schwarzenegger movies 
uh, with some friends like earlier this week. And one of them said something about is this, which movie is it where his voice gets dubbed over? And I think it's Hercules in New York. It, uh, I, that makes sense. Yeah. And you know, he, he tried to, you know, lose his accent. I know. And tried to shed that as much as possible. Um, but then it became him. But then that was kind of the endearing part of him. So, you know, as that's he, a good word, endearing. And, uh, hey, you know, Claudius. Yeah. And everybody has a Schwarzenegger impression because he you is. You killed my brother. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> but he's just, he was, you know, he was it for the 90s. He was the dude you wanted in your movie. Good call. And here's the last one. Until director Paul Verhoeven allows the violence to reach the berserk level, or berserk level, Arnold Arnold Schwarzenegger and a spectacular special effects team seem on their way to a futuristic classic. Nice. Thank you, horrible review, for kind of leading to, yeah, it is a futuristic classic. And a a lot of the effects, even at the ending, as if they may be done poorly for the '90s, they still hold their ground this day and age, in my opinion. I mean, as far as practical effects go, back then, you know, I remember seeing that and being like, "How did they do that?" Where they shoved the thing up his nose. Yeah, exactly. You know, like how did they do that? And I remember seeing, you know, they used to have a show on TV hosted by I forget his name, Pat something, Pat O'Brien or Pat something i forget called how'd they do that and all it did it was like on abc or something and all they did was show you like how they made um commercials and uh tv uh and movie yeah, stuff that. and like visual effects and um the one that i remember was like there was a coca-cola commercial with paula abdul dancing with um bing crosby or somebody i can't remember who it was but um I remember seeing uh, Total Recall, um, you know, either on one of those or like on the the, some movies when they hit HBO would be on like um, they would have like the special features uh, equivalent of making of the movie on HBO. And I think this was one of those. But I definitely call. I remember how they do that. Yeah, that was a, it. Was a good good show. I think it was on TGIF, like at the end of TGIF. How'd they do cool. that? Came on Fridays. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. I, last one, which is I'm going to leave it on a positive note because the, everything that I just read was weird to me, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Ver, Verhoeven keeps the whole thing chugging along neatly with a huge dollop of ultra violence and gore. Schwarzenegger is at his best ever. Nice. Who who was that from? Do you have the source on that one? Yeah, sci-fi movie page, James O'Henley. Nice. Good job. Random guy, but he... he, He's getting into them. That was from 20 years ago, by the way. And the movie came out 30 years ago. Yeah. So, like we said, this movie starts out with the badass opening credit scene over the grand cinematic score. And after the opening intro, we get our main character, Douglas Quaid, played by Schwarzenegger, who awakens from a bad dream about being on Mars with a mysterious woman. And his wife, Lori, played by Sharon Stone, tries to help him forget about Mars by giving him some morning sex. (laughs) Uh, And, uh... So (laughs) apparently he has this dream quite often and is becoming a little obsessed with Mars. And in this futuristic setting, like space travel, planetary vacations and cruises are normal due to the colonization of the solar system. They don't really ever say when this is supposed to be set. And I kind of like that because it's like, hey, this is in the future. You know that shit. Look at all that stuff with buttons on it. 2082. 2082? But they never say it, though. They sure as hell do. When? I don't know, but it just stuck with me because when I watched it this past time, first of all, whenever Sharon Stone is pressing him for morning sex, watching that for the first time, it's like, okay, oh, that's kind of hot. But watching it again, she wants him to tell her 
about this stuff because she knows that he knows some shit. Right. From from a du- double agent standpoint. Well, but they mentioned 2082, dude. When? I don't know. I just it stuck with me and I, I knew we were going to bring it up during the podcast and I was going to be like 2082 is when this movie takes place. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying the whole time I watched it, I was trying to figure out when it was set. And maybe you saw it in like a newspaper or something they show or something. No, I'm just saying that I have no All right, sources. fine. It's 2082. We'll go with that. <laughs> Go Smart on. ass. Let's go. So, so yeah, and when they're fooling around in bed, I got the remastered version, and like they uh, they upres the visuals and everything, and like made it oh, all great. HD and stuff. And so when they're messing around in bed, you can see Schwarzenegger's bare ass. Yes, and like like I don't think it was supposed to be shown, um, but you know it's better than when I was watching Terminator and you could see his full dick. Well, that and. I'm like HD did, has ruined some Schwarzenegger for me. When we did the do- <laughs> when we did the Doors movie, at least they had skin colored underwear on when they were humping. But this yeah. one is just full blown Schwarzenegger naked in bed. Yeah, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he came to screw you, Benny. <laughs> So, so Doug and Lori are uh, they're watching uh, the morning news while eating breakfast. I always wondered what kind of cereal he had in that bowl. And like, did he have like the Star Wars blue milk? I'm thinking it was tasty wheat. Because okay. anyone in the future is definitely eating tasty wheat. Tasty wheat. It's so, a reference from the Matrix. Yeah. So... <laughs> So uh, the governor of Mars is a man no- named Vilos Kohagen. And Kohagen! He's, he's trying to put down a rebellion of guerrilla fighters who feel oppressed by him. Uh, and on his way to work, Quaid sees an ad um, for a company called Recall, which is spelled with a K, and I completely forgot that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. And one of the main things I wanted to talk about was a lot of people – waving the flag of the Mandela effect said that right right recall was spelled R E C but somehow with the 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 powers that be messing with the uh, time space time continuum <laughs> it's now spelled with a K oh those powers that be why do they always be i, I think that it has to do with uh, cern so <laughs> So the ad for uh, he sees this ad for recall and it's a company which specializes in the implants of exotic vacation memories complete with photos and souvenirs, which is great. And it why is, is his great. co-worker such a dickhead? About oh, it? Harry from work. Like, why <laughs> is like, hey, Quay, don't go over to recall. They're going to scramble your brain. Like, well, now that you see it, you kind of you kind of see you know, this is definitely a movie you have to watch more than once to kind of catch the nuance and stuff. Um, I think I think with all Philip K. Dick uh, movies, uh, movie adaptations, you know, you definitely have to like a scanner darkly. Watch that the first time and try and tell me what it's about. You know, oh man, good call. Good call with, with the dick. So <laughs> it's good dick. Don't get me wrong. He uh, <laughs> he talks to his co-worker, uh, Harry about uh, recall implant vacations like you said he he was like i know a guy that went there and i'm from new york obviously and this guy <laughs> this friend of mine who went there to get a pizza pie he got his brain <laughs> scrambled and but, then Schwarzenegger was like no shit no oh, shit no, no shit <laughs> no shit <laughs> so against the judgment of his friends and his wife uh doug decides to stop at recall and you know one thing I did want to mention with the recall like the, name. The pizza pie thing. That's so good. You're welcome. So one thing I did want to uh, talk about with the recall thing. Immediately when I saw this the first time, and even when I saw it this time, it tricked me again. I thought, oh, recall. That's where they got the name of it. The, you know, it's called Total Recall because total this place recall. is Total Recall. You know, like the company is at the center of this. Well, that's not the case. The case is, we'll get to it. So, and... Uh, Jeez, you know how to keep us in suspense, man. I do. 
So he decides to, Doug decides to stop at recall and get some more info straight from the horse's mouth. And he asks him about their questionable reputation, questionable reputation. And the salesman assures him that the procedure is completely safe. And he also tells Quaid that they're now offering vacations that are unique because they're able to alter who you are. You know, Which is he, genius. He's like, what's, you go on vacation, what's, what's the same everywhere you go? You are. No, we can change that and make you a different man, change your identity. You can be anybody you want. So Quaid decides to buy a custom implant where he is like a super spy, top secret agent on Mars. And he saves the planet, gets the girl of his dreams, and that's the story that he wants. And so... They put him in this machine and he begin implanting the memories. And this is when shit goes haywire. Yeah, but they get to it because this is where it gets funky. Yeah. Quaid starts fighting off the employees and suppressed memories are beginning to reveal themselves. And he's like, you're going to blow my cover. And he believes he is a secret agent. And these people are just out to get him. And this freaks everyone out, and they decide to cover up what happened by refunding all of his money, sedating him, and dropping him in a Johnny cab to take him home. Hey, Johnny cab. (laughs) Have a wonderful day. (laughs) (laughs) So after getting him out of the cab, his friend Harry and some other dudes attack him. Yeah, why would they just do that? They attack him, but he, he straight up kills their ass. (laughs) <laughs> breaks all of their necks yeah, just murders everyone and <laughs> he pauses for a moment and he's like surprised at his combat skills but he doesn't hang out for too long and like he's he's like holy shit I'm, i guess i just murder <laughs> the best part is is like the, when the scene pans up after he murders everyone people are just walking on the streets yeah he throws the gun down you're like what the hell Okay, I get it. This hey, buddy, is- welcome to New York. So like you, you just killed this guy because he wanted to give you a pizza recommendation. Yeah, Apparently, he was your best friend for how many? How many years did they recall him in your brain? Yeah, he just, <laughs> just murders they, him. I mean, they never really had any connection. Like they probably, I think that was Cohagen's fault for not making him be better friends with the people that he murdered. Right. So he rushes upstairs to his apartment where Lori is taking a virtual tennis lesson. And after he cleans the blood off his hands, uh, the lights in the apartment go out and a mysterious figure starts shooting at Quaid. And he disarms the assailant and finds out it's Lori. And they have like a total Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Smith, Mr. and Mrs. Smith (laughs) style fight in their apartment. Good call. Good and they're call. like, I mean, he just straight up throws her ass over some furniture. She's raining bullets. I mean, it's it's pretty intense. It's pr- it's a good it's a good fight scene. So Lori tells him that she's not really his wife, but she's one of Cohagen's agents who was sent to monitor him. Their whole life together is a lie, and he has had all of his memories erased and new ones implanted. And Lori gets caught trying to stall for time when uh, Quaid sees some armed men entering the building. Yeah, she sings like a canary at the drop of a hat. Yeah. He knocks her ass out and takes off. And Michael Ironside, playing Richter, the leader of Cohagen's men, who were sent to retrieve Quaid. And uh, we find out in real life, Lori and Richter, they're actually lovers. Lovers. So Michael Ironside tongue. has landed Sharon Stone. And they kiss a lot with their tongue. That's the most si- science fiction I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> Sharon Stone falls for this bald asshole. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, thank you. That's exactly what I needed to hear. So this assignment obviously never sat well with Richter, who compared to Schwarzenegger should be insecure. Because his <laughs> wife is playing the role of Quaid's wife and even going so far as to sleep with him. You don't, you go Schwarzenegger, you don't go back. Yeah, uh, you go Braunschwager, you <laughs> never go Blackwater. I, I got yeah, there's there's a joke in there, we just can't find it. So, and we, yeah. <laughs> Arnold Schwollenpecker. 
<laughs> Once you go Schwarzenegger, you never uh, nothing. Thank you God. never Let's get to continue. the chopper. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Quaid escapes and gets a call from a mysterious man who gives him a suitcase full of money, passports, and some gadgets, some other spy shit. And the guy tells him to wrap a wet towel around his head and block the signal of the tracking device that Cohagen has implanted into his head. So I always wondered, like, who the hell is this guy? Because he never shows up again. Never shows up again, even at the the end, whenever they're revealing everything. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'm I'm from the agency, and that's all you get. I expected him to be working with Hauser and Cohagen. Right. No. They like mention him. Yeah, I guess. So he once again, uh, Doug once again narrowly escapes Richter and his guys and goes to an abandoned building where he opens the suitcase and a pre recorded message begins playing of himself. And the video tells him that his real name is not Douglas Quaid, but Hausa. And while working for Cohagen, he joined the rebels on Mars when he realized he was fighting for the wrong side. He also informs him that some of the miners on Mars uncovered a mysterious ancient alien artifact. And he also instructs Quaid on how to remove the tracking bug in his head with one of the tools in the suitcase. And this shit is crazy. When you hear it crunch, that's when you pull it. Yeah. Don't be a stupid idiot. I remember I remember when this came out in 1990 and this was the first time I saw the movie I was walking through my aunt and uncle's living room and they had rented this movie to watch with my parents and some fa- at some family get together or whatever but this nice. is the scene that I happened to catch and I was <laughs> like yeah he's got that thing up his nose and he's pulling on it and I'm watching this scene just absolutely captivated with what the hell I was seeing because it was like how the hell did they do that I mean, he was pulling something essentially from his forehead through his nose. Like, oh, it was so crazy. But it, it looks so real, but you know it's not. Your mind is telling you this is real, but there's a little portion of your mind that's saying, uh, that, yeah, that is an animatronic type puppet right, that was right. made, made by the studio. Right. But it was still really, really cool to see that kind of effort put into making that scene. Oh, absolutely. Yes. That that's what makes this movie top notch is because of scenes like that and the other ones when they're on the surface of Mars. I mean, yeah. all of the the effects like that make this movie. I mean, that's just a small portion of what makes it, but it it's a beautiful the the motion picture of it. It just it's beautiful. Right. And, and disgusting at the same time, let's be honest. Right. So Hauser uh, then tells Quaid to get your ass to Mars. 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 And check in at the Hilton. And he hides the tracking device in a rat and eludes Richter and his guys again while escaping to Mars disguised as an overweight, red-haired woman to get through customs. And we get that two weeks. How long are you planning on staying on Mars? Two weeks. Uh, do you have any fruits or vegetables with you? Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. As the, the robot breaks down, another really cool scene because you're like, whoa, spy tech. Yeah. Yeah, because, because you don't actually see him board the ship to get to Mars. It's just you're on Mars now. Be yeah, watch. you're on Mars. You get like an establishing shot, but that's about it. So Richter and his guys are in the customs line. Uh, trying to get through the the uh, spaceport, and they see Quaid's disguise, and he starts to freak out. And there's a big shootout, and Quaid escapes. Pretty pretty cool action scene. Love the two weeks lady do it. Two weeks, like she starts to scramble and shit. It's it's a cool effect. Yeah, her head explodes. Iconic scene. So he goes to the Hilton and they tell him that he left something in the safe and it's a flyer for a brothel in Venusville called The Last Resort. And the flyer has his handwriting on it telling him to ask for Melina. So outside of the Hilton, he meets a cab driver named Benny who takes him to Venusville, which is like a slum full of people that have mutated due to shitty construction of the radiation shielding from the sunlight or some shit. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's just a creature feature in this town and the effects and prosthetics are awesome. Like they really kind of give you this 
unearthly vibe. Like you, you kind of don't want to look at them because they almost make the people look handicapped. Like you feel like you're staring at somebody who, you know, just they something they. I don't know. I feel like I'm looking at like staring at like a person who has like part of their eyeball missing or something like that. I almost feel. Well, rude. yeah. Why? Why in the hell does Tony have a bunch of skin flabbed over his face? Oh, in the back of his head, I noticed this time. It's like messed up. Excuse me. Oh, you're fine. Blow, blow my nose. So, yeah, and, and we find out that that one psychic and the little girl are his wife and daughter. No, they're not. Yeah, at the end of the movie, they're all hugging. Quaid? No, 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 not Quaid's daughter, Tony's daughter. Oh, yeah, well, the, yeah, I, I see the resemblance. The, yeah. Do you want to know your future? The mutants say. Like, no, I don't. Yeah. I want to see three titties, okay? <laughs> there is a three titty scene, also uh, very formative of my youthful years. <laughs> so, <laughs> damn, girl, you make me wish I had three hands. <laughs> so <laughs> he finds Melina, who's the woman from his recurring dreams, um, and she believes that he was dead, but now suspects him of working for Cohagen. So she basically tells him to go get fucked. And uh, he goes back to his hotel room and is met by Dr. Edgemar, played by that uh, fat cop from uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, that Bill and Ted possess his dad and his friend or whatever. And they're like, let's go get some donuts. And they walk outside in their bodies. Do you know the scene I'm talking about? Yes, I do. It worked in The Exorcist 1 and 2. So, anyways, obscure reference. The doctor tells him that he's stealing the chair at, or he's still in, he's stealing the chair. He's still in the chair at recall. And everything since the moment he sat down there has been a dream. And he opens the door and Lori walks in and reaffirms Edgemar's claims that Quaid has been has suffered a schizoid embolism and is now trapped inside his own fantasy. And the doctor tells Quaid that if he doesn't go with him and return to reality, he'll end up being lobotomized and turned into a vegetable. And mm -hmm. he, offers, he offers Quaid a pill that will wake him up, but Quaid sees through their bullshit and shoots Edgemar, which the matrix with the scene dripping sweat. Yeah. The scene you were talking about in The Matrix, or you know how you were talking about how these, this movie was like the precursor to The Matrix, you know, about questioning reality and that kind of shit. You know, that's kind of a, a running thing for Philip K. Dick stuff. Like, uh, uh, what's the, oh my gosh, I'm losing it. Harrison Ford, Blade Runner. In Blade Runner, they kind of do the same thing. And in this, you know, that pill scene where Edgemar is trying to get him a pill, he's like, you take the red pill, you know, you basically uh, will continue to exist, you know, take the blue pill and you'll end up staying here. You know, that whole thing is, I don't want to say ripped off, but a very similar scene, you know, in The Matrix where you see it in Morpheus's eyes, the two hands. Anyways. Very good call. Good call. So Richter and his dudes bust in and arrest him. Uh, and while they're waiting for the elevator, uh, Melina attacks in an attempt to free him. And Lori kicks the shit out of Melina. But Quaid shoots his wife in the head. And we get a great Arnold one-liner as she says, But I'm your wife. And he shoots her in the head and looks into the camera and says, Consider this a divorce. Perfect. Yeah, it's a good one. So Richter finds Lori dead and now he's just driven partially insane with rage and wants revenge on this bastard who not only banged his girl on the reg, but he just straight up shot her in the back of the head. Like he, he has gone and done it. Well, well, Richter wanted to kill Hauser before Cohagen made him go back to earth. Right. They never their working relationship was subpar is a good way to say it. In all honesty, I never really paid attention to what Cohagen said towards the end, whenever everything got flipped on yeah. itself, and I'm like, holy, holy shit, this is a different movie now that like Hauser is like, hey, I want my 
feedback and I'm like, you fucking dick. Yeah. So it, t- it turned into a different movie for me. It really did. And, you know, if you look at this movie up to this point, this is the this is the origin story of uh, Richter. You know, like this is he's going. This is Batman watching his parents get shot and going full vigilante. And yeah, I hate to say it, but you could write a uh, pretty good movie from Richter's point of view where Quaid is absolutely the enemy. <laughs> well, yeah, there you could easily make a prequel for this with Hauser being the bad guy and the rebels trying to get air. Oh, I know. But the beauty of this movie is that it drops you into this story and lets you pick up the clues as you go. So it keeps you engaged the whole time because oh, Justin, you're trying to put it together. That's whenever I said, "Did I was this the one that I said, this is the Empire Strikes Back of this universe? Yeah, it absolutely is. <laughs> like this, you pick off, you pick up right where the shit is the shittiest. Yeah, this is, this Wait, is the Empire Strikes Back of... No, it's a new hope. It's a new hope. Empire Strikes Back already happened for it. And Quaid is a new hope, apparently. Well, I mean, it's kind of a, a bit of both, but I think, you know, this is the middle chapter of a great story, but you don't get the uh, the full resolution of anything. Yeah, you don't get any of that. You just get all the drama and all this nutball kicking. Yeah. That if, you, if you like to see Sharon Stone kick testicles. <laughs> so so <laughs> Melina and Quaid. Uh, jump in uh, Benny's cab and race back to the last resort, which has some like speakeasy style tunnels built into it. And the three of them escape into the tunnels with the help of Molina's mutant rebel friends. Uh, and no one in the last resort <clears throat> gives up. What do you say? Excuse me. Thank you. Why do I have to remind you? I don't know. Benny. So, so no one in the last resort gives up where they are. And when Richter and his boys show up, uh, Cohagen decides he's just going to shut off the air supply to Venusville and suffocate all the people in mutants. <laughs> Who decided to give this man this much power? <laughs> all right, he's the governor. Let him have control of who breathes and who doesn't. Yes, like no one's going to say uh, that's wrong. That you're going <laughs> to suffocate all, in all of these children. Maybe we should review the Constitution of Mars. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to be in charge? Apparent- <laughs> okay, that, you know what? That's not cool on Earth, but well, on, on, on Mars, okay. You can yeah. suffocate. For it. Go yeah. for it. Yeah. So uh, through the tunnels, uh, Melina, Quaid, and Benny find the rebel base, and Quaid is taken to meet the mysterious leader of the Resistance, a man who has never been seen before named Quato. And as it turns out... <laughs> He has been hiding in plain sight on the stomach of one of Melina's friends named George. Quato is this creepy, psychic, Chucky doll baby thing. And the effect is so fucking creepy and unnerving every time I see it. But I love it. Like I could not agree with you more, but watching it now that I haven't watched this movie since I've had kids. And now that I've watched <laughs> it with having kids, I'm like... Aw, change his diaper, motherfucker. <laughs> All Quato needs is his baba. So <laughs> I, I'm i going to admit something here that I've probably never told anyone. I used to have nightmares about Quato when um, uh, one of my aunts was pregnant. And oh, like shit. I remember being like, oh, my gosh, like thinking like she had like if if she'd lifted up her shirt a little bit, I'd see little Quato on her stomach. It freaked me out. But Start the reactor. Quaid. It's so open, creepy. You open your mind. The animatronics. <laughs> the animatronics of the mouth of it. Yeah. They're so off. Uh, they're so scary that they're Yeah, on. like did they really need to coat him with all of that almond butter to make <laughs> him look? <laughs> he is a greasy little bugger, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if you live under a man's shirt, you would sweat a lot. You would need a lot of lube. Yeah, he's greased up. It's like, geez, Quato, could you not have showered before you came? Like, you're just it's hanging like, out. I'm sure Quato tells the big guy what to do. Yeah, I mean. Open your mind. 
That was the Morpheus before Morpheus was cool right there, motherfucker. <laughs> it's pretty true. So he Quado forms this psychic bond with Quaid to dig into his memories. And Quado tells him that the alien artifact that the miners found on Mars is a reactor near the core of Mars. Now the reactor, follow me on this. The reactor will melt the icy core of Mars and create an atmosphere for the planet which can sustain life and eliminate Cohagen's ability to control the air supply. So that's a pretty... I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I didn't do the research. I don't know if the science checks out. But man, that's a fucking cool idea. Yeah, the science checks out. That is a cool idea (laughs) because it ejects oxygen into the atmosphere for all we know, that's how Mars works right now. We don't know. I've never so, been there. Well, you should go because it's beautiful. Well, think that I went there. Mm. Hence the whole plot of the movie. Blah. So suddenly the base is wrecked uh, by some mining equipment and the police force uh, infiltrates and as they're escaping, Benny double crosses them and turns them over to Cohagen, who he's been working for all along. And Quato gets shot in his baby growth head. The yeah, yeah. The effect of that thing getting shot, I could have done. Oh, yeah, me too. That was a little much. Like I don't want to they- see a, a like a forty five year old baby getting shot in the head. Yeah, I would, I would definitely put him at 45 years old. But if that's definitely. your thing, this is the movie for you. Yeah. I, I mean, it was very... After he got shot, he's like, Quaid, start the reactor. And then Richter blows him up in the head. It's yeah. like, uh, uh, That's that when you know that the bad guys really need some lessons taken to him. Yeah. Who elected this guy is what I want to know. Like, what was his campaign like? Elect me governor and I'll shut off the air supply to some people and make well, that's more exactly, great again. <laughs> I think that, that's exactly it. But, I mean, it's... I think the make thing Mars about Mars... again. Mars is such a young planet compared to Mar- compared to Earth. Is that no one cares, but... People moved there and got mutated as fuck and looked weird. So right. now everyone thinks they can take advantage of them, which is not cool. Yeah. But, and that's why the liberation had to happen. And th- the ending of Total Recall liberating the entire planet. I mean, you cannot. I mean, that's the most poetic ending that, that you could possibly have for this story. Right. And I mean, it. It it really is like, you know, the whole time you're watching this movie, you're trying to figure it out. Like as you go, the movie doesn't it's not like, oh, the, there's mutants in here and this is what they can do and stuff. It's just like, boom, mutant. Guess what? They exist. Fuck you. Pay attention. And it keeps you engaged the whole time because you're exactly not, there's no room for filler. There is no room for filler. No, because the action starts at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Right out the bat. So Cohagen explains that Hauser was his best friend and the Quaid persona was cooked up by the two of them so he could take down Coato and end the rebellion. And Quaid and Melina are taken to a memory implant lab where Hauser's memories will be put back into Quaid and Melina will be his obedient sex slave. <laughs> How's nice. that for punishment? However, Schwarzenegger goes full fucking Schwarzenegger and breaks free by killing a room full of scientists. And this is that part you were talking about where he's got the, the arm cuffs, like he's cuffed down to that chair and he pulls up and there's like a stick of rebar or whatever stuck to his hand. He just stabs a motherfucker through the head. And so they get out and they kill all these scientists and Doug Quaid and uh, Molina escape to the mines and head for the reactor Uh, in order to activate it. Um, And Benny shows up in a mining machine and tries to kill him. But Quaid uses his huge drill and stops the machine, kills Benny, and he goes out with another Schwarzenegger one-liner of, Screw you! Yes, but mind you, during the uh, 
grand TV edit version of the early 90s. It was, no, Benny, drill you. Drill you. Why is that any different? I really don't know, but I'd like to play to you the sound right now. Please do. <laughs> oh, it's good. So I don't know. I don't know why "Screw You" was different than "Drill You" back in 1995, but it was. Uh, <laughs> so Screw Mal- you. So, <laughs> Melita and Quaid use a holographic projector to fool Richter and his men and kill them, and it's a pretty badass scene uh, where they're using this technology to wipe these guys out. And Richter and Quaid fight on a lift on their way to the reactor. And Quaid chops off Richter's arms and he falls to his death. Uh, when and then, Quaid... And then he says, see you at the party. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't get that one-liner. That one fell because a little he, flat. Because he punched him in the face because they were going to the after party because Kilhagen was like, wipe his brain. And Richter's like, is he going to remember any of this? And they're like, no. So he punches him in the face. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's at the that that's why when they were going up the lift and he Richter he's like ah, and your arms just got chopped off he's like see you at the party oh my gosh I never even caught that yeah so stupid so when Quaid gets to the reactor room Cohagen has rigged the room to explode and Melina shows up during uh, the fight and. The bomb is armed and Quaid chucks it through a tunnel, but this destroys part of the fake dome atmosphere thing. So everyone's being sucked out to the surface of Mars, the surface of Mars. And uh, just before he gets sucked out, Quaid starts the reactor, which quickly begins to build the atmosphere as Cohagen and Molina and he suffocate in some of the craziest effects in the movie. And this really was the part of the movie that I was like, holy shit, this is graphic. Yeah, this is the part where the movie is holy shit version because you have these puppets essentially. Right. Get it because apparently Mars, the pressure is so um, low that when pressure is low, it makes your it makes water boil like like how whenever there's like you're boiling macaroni and cheese if you you live in colorado you have to boil it at a certain time different than if you live somewhere else that is at a different elevation of sea level so apparently the pressure on mars is so high or low that if you go on the surface it boils your blood so essentially their blood is boiling out of their system and that's nothing factual that I'm getting from the internet right now. This is just what I learned from high school biology. I love when you go full science. So anyways, Cohagen dies because his eyes and his tongue and shit are sucked out of his face. Uh, like we said, really graphic. The rest of Mars, including our friends over in Venusville, uh, are able to breathe the air and they walk out to the surface of the planet Uh, And Quaid starts wondering if this is a dream or not before turning to kiss Melina. So basically the movie tries to fuck with your head because it's like, hey, remember that story that he said back at Recall? Like he completely, um, he completely. Yeah, it's like, is this an actual, is it a dream? Is this the dream? Did you watch this man's dream vacation? Or was that what really happened? Because, you know. It kind of it kind of fucks with you a little bit, but there's I mean most of the story you get these hints that hey it's actually happening, you know I mean the guy killed his wife so <laughs> so which is the real part uh, I don't is know I mean a lot of us guys are, are we want to take that vacation where we can kill our wife oh yeah I want to go on a kill my wife vacation. You know what? I'd like to uh, forget everything and just shoot my wife in the head and run off with some fantasy woman. So Yeah, that vacation you're advertising, all <laughs> I need is that a gun and shooting my wife, and yeah. I'm good. I'd like to kill my wife package. Now, is that more expensive than me burn my children alive? 
<laughs> oh I mean, gosh. it's twisted if you think about it. So It's so super twisted. It's horrible. <laughs> so I like to think that this movie is what actually happened and that, you know, he was a spy that realized where his, like, that he was an asshole and turned things around by helping this rebellion. Yeah, I like to think that way, too. Rather than being a wife murdering dick face. Like, how can we cheer for that? Well, Hauser, so, obviously, we learned that Hauser was an asshole. Right. And that Hauser and Cohagen were best friends. Right. Cohagen is now dead. How, Quaid is. Hauser was turned into Quaid. Quaid started the reactor. Right. And now everything is cool. Kind of, sort of. Even though it's kind of still weird. It's kind of awkward. Right. But if you think about it, like, you know, there's so much lore to the backstory and the the continuation of this story. Like, like we said, you're given the middle chapter of a book and this is what you have to do with it. You have to figure the shit out as you go. And one of the things that always uh, kind of rubbed me the wrong way was like, I shouldn't say rubbed me the wrong way, but like in this, in this world is like, when does the dream start one, but also, uh, you know, it obviously, if you watch it close enough, it starts from, from the time he sits down in the chair, if that's kind of the ending that you want. But, you know, this is the story of a rebellion taking back Mars and, you know, this guy being kind of like reprogrammed during the middle of it. So, you know, if you saw the movie Rogue One with the um, the evil droid K2SO, this is like K2SO's story from the moment before and during when he gets switched from being a Empire droid to being part of the Rebellion. You know, like he decides that, hey, the Rebellion's actually doing some good and I want to be a part of that. Okay. So, when Good I watched reference. this movie this time, I was like, oh, that's an interesting perspective to basically take the guy who has been flip-flopped and make make the story revolve around him. I don't know. I thought it was... Um, watching it again, like I said, I haven't seen this movie for probably about between, no, that's a, between that's six a, and ten years. A but, great observation on a great angle for the movie, and I definitely feel the same way that's that's great that's genius but so the one thing that we haven't quite wrapped up just yet was the the name total recall for the movie it's actually based off of the idea at uh at one point that i think it's michael ironside says you know if we don't get to him soon he'll have total recall so it's not named after the company recall it's named after him actually recalling everything, which he does eventually. Uh, not a hundred percent, but not a hundred percent. But, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about as well, the, the head puppets on Mars, um, when they get sucked out on the surface, those, uh, those, I don't know if you've seen it before, but the guy we shouted out at the beginning of the, uh, episode, Chris Ferrucci, um, he's on Instagram. He's a friend of ours that, uh, has, has done like busts of like Schwarzenegger and Terminator. He's working on the predator right now. The actual, yeah, predator, very predator. talented, very talented individual. He's yes. done his Freddy Krueger is freaking amazing. Um, he's done Michael Myers from Halloween, Jason Voorhees, all kinds of, uh, mostly horror movie busts. The terrifier. He's good. Yeah. At the terrifier. Well, and I asked him to uh, if he would be interested in building a bust for uh, of Schwarzenegger's face when he's on Mars, when his eyeballs are getting sucked out and stuff. Oh, man. And he said he was very interested uh, in doing that. So I'm hoping to, yes. see, hoping to see him actually do it. And, oh, uh, God bless America. That is that's my Graceland right now. Yeah, I would love to to buy that from him and and do something with it. Put it in my kid's bedroom while they're sleeping or something. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, anyways, just, you know, that's that was the reason for his shout out this week. And, you know, I'm excited to see what he can come up with after he finishes Predator, which is looking awesome. BT dubs. I agree. So anything else you want to add? No, that is good. I think we ran through it. I, 
I really wanted to harp on the uh, the nut shots that Schwarzenegger took during the movie, and we did. Yeah. I'm glad we did. How would you like to be Schwarzenegger's testicle stunt double for this movie? Just uh, Sharon Stone booting your boys? Well, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be a retired millionaire that does not have a working <laughs> penis? Or do you want to... Do you want to be us guys living a normal life with yeah. a working dick? Yeah. Do you want to be Quaid or Hauser? <laughs> yeah, you want to be Hauser. <laughs> no. Are you Quaid or are you Hauser? Uh, so, Mitchell, it's come that time. Prep your little sound effect, Mitchell, because I'm going to go on a rant. I love how ungood that is. <laughs> so usually on this show we like to talk about films that weren't well received but for this episode we just wanted to talk about one of the coolest fucking movies ever made surprisingly there is some disparity among critics on this one metacritic has it at a 57 out of 100 and rotten tomatoes and imdb are a bit more forgiving and you and i are both huge schwarzenegger fans i mean he's funny he's charming he's charismatic Rarely takes himself too seriously in most roles. And you combine all that with his physical press presence and his thick Austrian accent and his ability to punctuate most good action scenes with a great one-liner. And you have one of the most hilariously quotable actors in the history of cinema. His movies are always fun to watch and just endlessly entertaining. This movie is a fucking brilliant look at the future of like virtual reality and virtual memories, which questions the nature of reality and existence. And it's an action spy film, kind of like True Lies. It's a sci-fi thriller, which is a fucking classic starring one of the most bankable stars of the 90s. And it's not just a fun film, but it's also a really smart film. And Arnie brings his usual charm and pronunciation to the role. But the selection of Paul Verhoeven to direct was one of the most divinely inspired decisions made behind the scenes. Because Verhoeven's never been one to shy away from effects and violence, and this movie highlights that. The effects may look a little dated by today's standard, but pretty much hold up. And but for being, you know, for being a big budget action film in the pre-everything CGI era, these practical effects and the use of miniatures, makeup, prosthetics, puppetry are all tied together in a near perfect package of a Philip K. Dick inspired movie, which philosophizes about the nature of our reality and our identity. And yes, I said philosophizes because damn it, that's a Bill and Ted reference within itself. Nice. So this movie was remade in 2012 and that version doesn't really hold a candle to this one. According to the critics, it only has a 30% Uh, critic score on Rotten Tomatoes compared to the original's 82%. But every scene of this movie is a fucking thrill ride. You know, get ready for the ride of your life. There are so many cool practical effects and twists and turns in the story that it has nearly everything that piques my interest in films and makes me enjoy movies. The writing is solid. The fantasy is impressive. The world it builds is pure cinematic magic And this film is a classic piece of sci-fi that should not be missed by movie fans. End rant. Nice. Nice rant. Sit down. Sit down. I I don't accept your standing ovation. Sit down. So, I mean, this movie is is one of those movies that is always going to be a part of me because of what it did and what it made me think and feel about movies, which is basically this was one of the films that got me interested in movies and made that such a big, made me such a big fan of uh, what they can do on camera. Well, I agree with that. And I want to look, I think, for films like these, we need to have actual statistics, but the budget at the top end was $65 million and the box office was $261 million. So yeah. that's obviously a success. Right, right. Oh, well, Mitchell, because I'm delaying for time, 
because I'm trying to find something on my computer, I'm just saying words for people to hear. Anyways, it's time for the plug. <laughs> yes, just, don't don't forget the Twitter feed. So just a reminder to check us out at nextlevelnerd.com where the opinions are so good they ought to be facts. And be sure to like, subscribe, and share all of our podcasts such as Handsome Evan and the Nerd Herds Gaming Podcast, Sugar Frosted Serial, the TV Podcast, and 321 Lay On, the Live Action Role Play Podcast. So we want to keep creating quality shows for our listeners and keep growing the NLN community. So we just want to ask that if you could help us out, please go to patreon.com slash nextlevelnerd and drop us a buck or two. Donating at any level will get you the exclusive access to this month's bonus episode. And next month, uh, we already have one planned. And you and I will talk about the opening credits episode Uh which could be a cool a cool topic to discuss. So like we said, be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you can catch next week's episode when we'll be talking about the 1991? How many 91 movies have we done? Uh, early 90s. I love it. Cinematic classic Steven Spielberg presents Hook. Until next time, spread the word. Spread the nerd. It's a take your turn when you have to turn. You know we. Yeah, boy. Back up on this shit. Representing Cashmere 1-9. Say goodbye, Mitchell. Goodbye, Mitchell. Hey, you.